Okay, we're starting recording. So good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to this webinar on the Low Carbon Public Procurement Report developed by UNEP in the framework of the Asia-Pacific GPP Network, which is supported by uh, Katie. We believe that the potential impact of GPP in the mitigation of climate change is clearly underestimated. And we've been active in promoting the contribution of public procurement to the achievement of the Paris objectives. For example, at COP21, we started a few years back this, this uh, drive and this promotion of uh, public procurement in towards climate mitigation. So already in 2015, we developed with our colleagues, with our Korean colleagues and other organizations, the Seoul Declaration, which was adopted in November, November 2015 in Seoul and was presented at COP21. At COP25 in Sharm el Sheikh, we also organized the side event on net zero carbon through public procurement, which uh, regrouped uh, a number of countries that presented their experience in this area. For example, we had uh, Norway, we had Korea, we had uh, the US, we had Egypt present their, uh, the way they uh, channel and they, they leverage uh, public procurement to make it uh, an effective tool in climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, today we will present you the initial findings of our report, which is being dra drafted by Ms. Jelly Molino. The objectives of the report are to present the current state of low carbon public procurement in the Asia Pacific region. We also try to identify common challenges and opportunities in low carbon public procurement policy development and implementation. We want to highlight also both regional and global LCPP best practices and provide an understanding of how low carbon criteria may be introduced and or integrated into every stage of the public procurement cycle. Major objective also is to make sure that public procurement and sustainable public procurement is introduced in national, nationally determined contributions that are developed by countries on a regular basis and uh, provide the, the, the work plan that is adopted by countries to uh, fight climate change. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ms. Molino to present us the report and its initial conclusions. This is also a training event, so we will have longer opportunities of interaction as in regular webinars. So. Jelly, Jelly, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Farid. So allow me to share my screen. So can you see my screen now? Yes, we can, Jelly. OK. So again, um, um, good morning, good afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. And thank you, Farid. And also to the members of the Asia Pacific um, GPP network who are present um, today. So for this Sorry, session, Julie, maybe you can present in uh, use the. Uh, the presenter mode. Oh, OK. OK, good. Is it now? Yeah, very good. OK, wait. Um, is it in present? OK, oh, wait, wait, I couldn't find it. I lost it. I'm sorry. This is the problem if you are not a very. Techy person, so you can see the slides. It's OK. OK, so again for this um, session, is it moving? Sorry, you're not in presenter mode. You, you're back to the another mode. Wait, let me try to. It was fine, but then you you changed something. Yeah, the only mode was right one. Is it okay? Now it's fine. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh huh. So, 
Uh, for this session, I will be presenting the initial assessment of our ongoing research on local food procurement policies and practices in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, of course, um, I will share first the objectives uh, and the methodologies that we are adapting, including, of course, the targeted countries and some informa important information on where we stand as a region in terms of emissions and what would drive us to strategically use public procurement in mitigating at least the impacts of climate change. And then, of course, I will give at the end an overview on how we could integrate local boom criteria in the public procurement um, cycle. So as already discussed um, by uh, Farid, um, the main objectives of this study is to present the status of LCPP in targeted countries. But it's important for us first to understand that the Paris Agreement recognizes the important role of sustainable um, patterns and consumptions. Um, in fact, uh, in addressing climate change. In fact, even the sustainable development goal is very clear, specifically in target 12.7.1, that it calls for sustainable public procurement. And as the largest um, spender in the market, which is of course us working in public procurement, which is equivalent to 13 trillion US dollar out of the global GDP, it is uh, we can leverage on our purchasing power to advance um, key policy objectives, which is of course, including protection of the environment through green public procurement. And we all know that from green public procurement, the idea of low carbon procurement has already emerged. In fact, even in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, more particularly in Korea, there are so many um, government agencies that have already encouraged the use of public procurement to purchase eco-friendly products and even um, mandated government agencies to track the record of their sustainable procurement. So we are going to present all of those um, assessment. Nonetheless, despite this particular potential, we reviewed the um, National Determined Contribution Report that had been submitted by the 194 parties in the Paris Agreement, and only 10% of those reporting countries really identified public procurement as a strategic policy that they are using. And in Asia Pacific, it, it is either only China and Vietnam have indicated in their reporting that they are actually considering and looking at the potential of procurement as their important instrument to achieve their uh, targets. In fact, as early as 2015, UNEP in partnership, of course, with Katie, have already issued this sole declaration on mitigating um, climate change through low carbon procurement. So it is for these reasons that we are now assessing on uh, the status of low carbon procurement here in uh, Asia Pacific with the hope that we can actually use public procurement to advance the national dairy contributions of uh, countries. And then of course we have to identify the challenges um, and opportunities for more LCPP in our region. In terms of methodology, um, we, we try to expand uh, as much as possible the methodology that we'll be using in this assessment. We conducted literature review. In fact, both a uh, peer-reviewed journal in terms of the legal assessment on public procurement and even on the practical and the practice sides. In fact, we covered 132 peer-reviewed materials. And then we also look at online resources in terms of case studies, tools, reports, and we were able to gather 51 materials. We also conducted stakeholder interviews. So I'm hoping that some of those that participated in their interviews are present here right now. And then we prepared, of course, 15 country fact sheets highlighting what are the policies and practices of uh, the uh, targeted countries in terms of low carbon uh, LCPP. And this particular uh, a webinar and training that we are going right now is actually part of the methodology. This is our stakeholder consultation work as well. I try my best to be on time so that at 
at the end of the presentation, we'll have more, more time for discussion because your inputs, comments will be very crucial in the, the finalization of this particular assessment. Of course, the limitation is that we focus only on 15 targeted countries and we base them according to at least three major criteria. The first is whether or not they are a member of our network. And the second is if they participated in the 12.7 uh, monitoring exercises of UNEP and if they participated in the recently concluded 2022 SVP Global Review. So those are the three uh, criteria on how we're going to limit the targeted countries. So, and that is where we were able to identify the 15 countries that are covered in this particular assessment. And before that, it is important for us to really understand where we stand as, uh, as a region in terms of our emission. So one thing you can see in this particular data that is derived from the world economic data in terms of carbon emission, and also we try to look on the um, commitment of our targeted countries in terms of carbon reduction, you'll notice that our region has at least two of the, the important um, uh, aspects on how we actually monitor the emission index. We have, of course, one of the least um, uh, of the countries with the lowest in, in environmental impact in terms of carbon emission, Bhutan, it has the 100 um, index score. It's 100 means it has a lower lowest environmental impact. At the same time, we also have in our region the highest in terms of environmental impact, which is China with a score of zero. So if you will look, it's like our region has this particular, you know, uh, impact lowest and of course the highest. And then if you look at, uh, uh, although at least majority is still on the portion of 90 and above, which is very, very, uh, very good in terms of environmental impact. It has the, the lowest impact. And you'll notice also the uh, importance of knowing the carbon emission per individual per country. Because even if, for example, in this particular data, you'll notice that um, the country which has the lowest carbon emission per capita is um, Myanmar. Uh, so it is important specifically when we uh, interviewed some, some stakeholders, they are very, uh, uh, um, they are highlighting the importance of the buy-in of these citizens. So in that case, important for us also to understand like what is my carbon emission contribution because at the end of the day that is also impacting the overall uh, performance of our country. And then of course, if you look at the updated nationally determined contributions, we can have as, as low as 5% and most of the countries have this unconditional um, Con, uh, unconditional target, meaning that, you know, we have a very low target because it, I mean, for us to be able to actually uh, reduce our emissions, we need some technical assistance. So that's why our commitment usually depends on certain condition, which includes, of course, uh, financial support, technical support, specifically from countries that are uh, considered to be the highest uh, contributors of of carbon emission. So in this case, the, the, the target reduction really depends on some condition, specifically that most of the countries here in our region are really considered as highly vulnerable to the impact of climate change. So in this case, we also need to understand, you know, yes, we've been looking on this, all of this mitigating uh, effort on climate change impact, but in terms of public procurement, just recently, the World Economic Forum has computed the contribution of our, um, our field of specialization in terms of um, greenhouse gas emission. And accordingly, it is close to 15% of the annual greenhouse gas emissions. 
which is actually equivalent to that of the U.S. because the U.S. annual contribution is 15%. So in this case, public procurement per se is responsible, I mean, to the global contribution equivalent to that of the U.S., which is also considered as one of the top three emitters in um, uh, carbon emission. So imagine the impact that we could make if we are also considering the reduction of carbon emissions in our own uh, procurement. So here you'll see in this map the if you have a light green, it means that you have the highest impact. We need to make sure that soon our region will all be as green as, as Bhutan. And of course, we have to understand where we stand, at, at least on the, the terms of what has been done in terms of promoting low carbon public procurement. It is for this reason that we actually look at the literature as one of the methodologies. And as mentioned, out of those uh, research materials that we have reviewed, we identify like what are the low carbon public procurement framework that has been used by other countries. And in fact, we categorize it into at least list for framework, which is, of course, the same framework that we have been using in the um, Sustainable Public Procurement Global Review. And you will notice that at least in terms of the literature that we have reviewed, 53% uh, of the framework that is being used to promote um, carbon uh, emission criteria in public procurement is in the form of executive policies and programs. So it's, it's an initiative of the mostly the um, central or national government. And of course, this is followed by the state. So you'll see it's like the, the national government and local are those that are really doing some initiatives to promote low carbon public procurement and the legislation of this particular framework although increasing is still not a par with what the executive both from the national and the local departments are doing the problem uh, 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 with this particular initiative is we all if you look at the case of the us if the framework supporting low carbon public procurement is only in terms of the executive. It is as good as the term of the president sitting. So that happened in the case of former President Trump immediately, you know, um, revoking the previously issued executive orders by those uh, predecessors. So this is actually the, the, the one of the issues that on the legal perspective, is it really good that we rely solely on executive policies and programs. And of course, we try to, to map it based on the geographic coverage of this particular uh, framework. And we have noticed that if you look here in, although this is not regional because we try to like as much as, I mean, the literature covers so much of that of the U.S. alone. So we couldn't say that it is actually uh, North uh, America because mostly just the U.S. and Europe and then of course Asia. But if you look at the this particular graph, you'll notice that in the case of the Europe, there are more initiatives from the state, the member countries, of course, so there are many activities from the member countries. Um, and then in the case of, again, also in, in Asia, most are also with the executive and very rarely on the um, uh, legislative. The legislative only is um, observed in countries, OECD member countries in Asia. And you'll notice that only Europe has framework that is supported by judicial decisions. In fact, if you look at, if you analyze the literature in terms of legal framework, the court in Europe has a big role, specifically if, if uh, the European Court of Justice will issue a specific case law, then that will serve as an initiative for the European um, uh, commission to issue guide and for other countries to also comply. And of course, if you look at the, the terms of using carbon emission in terms of the year of the literature, 
And this is not really something new because as early as 1970, the U.S. has been issuing executive orders on the important roles of public procurement to reduce uh, our uh, public procurement for energy efficiency. So if from 1970, but at any rate, you'll notice that the problem, at least in how the assessment of the literature in terms of the U.S. is on the implementation. The implementation is really not as robust as that of Europe. So this is in terms of the literature. And then, of course, we also look at the different climate change law and policies. And then, of course, this is based on um, the climate law uh, organization. What they did is they actually, you know, collated all of these uh, laws and policies that are very specific to climate change. It is important for us to also understand this particular framework. Why? Because let's see how do these people working on climate change see the importance of our field public procurement and the fight against climate change. And here, if you look at the climate laws and policies specifically, and of course, I get this uh, data only to get the, from, from the Asia Pacific region. We look also, I mean, Japan is like an almost equivalent law, both from the executive and the legislative in terms of providing framework on the fight against climate change. But at any rate, I, I actually read them all and try to figure out. And then interestingly, of all of these uh, 371 laws and policies, only Japan, Mongolia, and South Korea have a very specific um, laws and policies recognizing the important role of public procurement and the fight against climate change. For example, in Japan, they have this particular environment consideration and contract law. And there it was very, uh, it was stipulated that in terms of contract law, um, the, the reduction of carbon emissions should be considered. In Mongolia, um, this is actually a policy, of course, when you speak of policy, it's, it's an executive uh, order where they also recognize the role of public procurement. In the Philippines, as early as 2006, I was actually um, surprised um, that there was already an executive order issued by then President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo on the role of government procurement on the promotion of energy efficiency. So at least in terms of the national government. And then of course, South Korea has this very uh, specific provision in its Carbon Neutral Act on how they could use public procurement, specifically mandating um, some criteria on greenhouse, um, greenhouse gas reduction and also promotion of energy efficiency criteria in their public procurement. So this is really uh, very interesting that despite the robust climate change laws and policies, uh, they have not yet, at least those working on this area, have not yet identified or recognized the very important role of our our field, so we have a lot of work to do. And then of course, we also look at the public procurement law, at least on our side, um, we are very, very um, active in promoting at least some sustainability clauses in the public procurement law. And as of this, this is like, we try to evaluate using the standard that is being used right now by the World Bank um, Global Public Procurement Data, on what should be the sustainability, minimum sustainability clauses in a public procurement law. And that should be like a specific provision on total cost of ownership, life cycle costing, value for money, or the meat clause, sustainability clause, even the, the award to SMEs and domestic preference. These are the last two are very important specifically if you are looking on the potentiality of reducing carbon emission in terms of transportation. So it's like you're localizing some of your procurement because of the possibility of reducing the contribution of uh, public procurement 
in carbon emission due to the uh, transportation um, requirement. So that is one of the, the, the reasons it is also considered as a sustainability class in terms of environment. But of course, we all know those of us working on sustainable procurement, that sustainability is not limited to the environment. It includes the three pillars of sustainable um, uh, development. But at sorry, sorry, Jali, we have a question here because we don't see uh, the color code here. Ah, you don't see the color code? No, because it's below, I, I suppose. And, and oh, at the there's... bottom of the slide, probably. Or you can just tell us, you know. Okay. You just okay. tell us, you know, what it means. Okay, the, the slides will be will be shared anyway. So at any rate, if you will look at this, although I'm sorry for, for that, if you can see the, the, the color coding here, the, what is crucial only is like, okay, it's think India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, they have all of these clauses in their public procurement law. In Myanmar, only the domestic preference clause. They didn't have any from total cost of ownership, even to the award of SMEs. They didn't have any provision in their public procurement law, at least the one that is published in the global uh, review. And then, of course, the other thing is that in terms of, um, for example, Bhutan doesn't have life cycle costing and sustainability clause, but they are more focused on total cost of ownership and value for money. And um, Cambodia didn't have life cycle and total cost of ownership, only value for money, uh, meat, and of course, uh, our uh, only value for money and meat. They don't have also the, the provisions for uh, So, so Jelly, it's clear that uh, the green color means that there is existence yes. of clothes. Orange yes, that it, it's not there, ah, but so what is blue? The no, blue no, is that, asking. okay, the blue uh, shows that they didn't have a specific clause on that, but you can actually look at some wording that may be interpreted. Let's say, for example, most economically advantageous standard. They didn't use that word, but they have provision of considering non-price criteria. They didn't have a concept of value. They didn't mention the word value for money, but they will be considering economic and social con con conditions in terms of uh, the uh, evaluation criteria. They didn't have the word sustainability clause, but they have also provision for environmental protection. So those are the blues, meaning that that's the, the clause were not expressly but if you navigate on some of the provision, you can actually interpret them to support those clauses. Thank you, doctor. So, That's very clear. OK, so let's now go on the policies and practices. Of course, we try to map them at least into three categories, the thematic policy supporting low carbon procurement, the use of eco labeling, and of course, product categories with a very specific um, mentioning that greenhouse gas emission reduction should at least be calculated expressly or impliedly. So if you will look at all of the policies and practices here, we look at all of those regulations that and, and policies that have been published, including the climate law and law policies, public procurement policies uh, and uh, practices in all of the reports that have been published, both literature, anything online, and even on the website of these particular countries, we'll notice that in this particular area, we have a lot of national thematic parties that can support low carbon property procurement. And in fact, a lot of them, except in the case of Cambodia, and, and um, um, oh, except, ex, except in the case of Bhutan, however, Cambodia, they didn't have at least on record indicated that they have um, eco labeling um, policies that is uh, 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 on record. So if there are people here on, 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 on those countries, uh, I would like to hear your, 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 your notes on that. And of course, in terms of product categories with specific greenhouse gas reduction, 
we have China, India, Indonesia, uh, and Korea, New Zealand, Philippines, and Singapore. So they have at least um, some uh, um, product categories that are very specific that they are considering greenhouse gas emission that is supported both by policies and they are actually practicing them. And of course, I want to share this, these stories because if you will notice back, they have problem with the law. They didn't have that much. And then, of course, in terms of policies and practices, they are not as robust as the other countries. But here we can learn a good stories. Say, for example, in Bhutan, they have yet to develop their green building uh, initiative in terms of public procurement. But they already have the anti-corruption uh, building already co is considered as one of their best um, story in terms of promoting the uh, green building. So this is actually the picture at, I'm sorry, the picture at the ba at the, the bottom, that is the anti-corruption. When they are looking at it, they, they look at the potentiality of reduce using as much as, as sun as possible. So it's like they want to make sure that it's energy efficient. So they have the design considered the use of energy e efficiency more on sun and solar and even in the heating that was the design. Although in this particular case, one of the challenges is the really the high cost because Bhutan is considered as an import dependent country, specifically in terms of construction materials. And if they're going to look at construction materials that are promoting energy efficiency at that time, they would have to get it from India and the costs were really very high to the point that when they are actually, you know, developing the design, they had this concept of hybrid. And the best practice that they did here is using their own uh, adobe clay, which of course, based on their Ha, history, this is one of the most sustainable materials. So this particular building in, in Bhutan, the anti-corruption building, is an example of how they were able to do it despite the fact that they don't have a very specific policy at the time on low carbon public procurement. And of course, this is not yet written in any of the materials that we have, have reviewed. And another one is, I want to highlight also the case of Cambodia. If you look at the, the previous slides, you'll notice that Cambodia doesn't even have all of these policies promoting low carbon public procurement. But in this case, they are now actually mandatory buying ocean friendly refrigerators. The, pr the problem before is that they couldn't do it because the law is not supporting, but the other law is in terms of the market, Cambodia has issued the prohibition of the entry to their country of any uh, refrigerators that has the CFC. So because of that particular law on the entry of these ozone depleting refrigerators, it becomes like the mandatory or the default product in the market. So the government is now buying it, not because, you know, they have all of these low carbon or, or sustainable or green procurement policy simply because the government prohibited the entry of ozone depleting refrigerators. So the market in itself is already promoting the ozone friendly rep. So the government is buying them. And then the other important story that I, I want to highlight is in terms of Sri Lanka, they don't have yet sustainable procurement, although I'm hoping and based on some of the discussion that they're about to uh, approve their sustainable public procurement uh, policy. Uh, I'm looking at the, the news. I haven't seen it. It was already approved, but say weeks from, from, from now, it will be approved by, by the government. But at any rate, even without that, they have this green building. They have this green building not because they have the policy, but because they have this green building certification. And there are private construction companies that are already certified as, as um, you know, they're doing green building. So when they are participating in government procurement, they brought with them their uh, green certification. So it's like the, the certification, the initiative to do green building comes from the private sector. 
So it's like they're saying, okay, since we're doing this green building already in our private uh, um, stake projects, we don't want to change our our design and system when we do it in the government. So in that case, because there are already private companies doing green building in their private practice, they are not changing it when they are participating in the government. So you see, these are some of the stories that are happening in our region yet not written, meaning that there are initiatives and this particular study is to highlight this initiative and hopefully pave the way to support them to address some of their challenges. And what are this? Of course, again, it's still on the cost. So they are thinking that, you know, when, when government is considering, for example, low carbon, and they are doing the managing of their budget, they say they are expensive and then thinking of their budget, so they couldn't as much as they would want to, they, it is difficult to manage a budget and then eventually go for low carbon products. Because again, as mentioned, for example, low emission vehicles, it is not just a perception that they are costly because they are due, according to our, our interview, they are really costly. So there is a, a, a problem in terms of managing the budget and then making sure that they also try to, to incorporate uh, carbon criteria in their, in their procurement. And then of course, again, some of the challenges pertain again to capacity building. Capacity building in the sense that, you know, Low carbon uh, climate change is, is a technical field. So even I on my 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 doing PhD, I have to study the science on climate change to be able to explain to people working on climate change public procurement. So it's it, it, imagine if you're doing more public procurement and then suddenly you you will be uh, uh, asked to study another field so they really have they really have to understand the importance of of low carbon and the science behind it in fact this is not just about low capacity in terms of those working on the the government even the the understanding of the the supply side in in one of the 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 stakeholders inputs was saying that you know even Product manufacturers, they are not aware of the uh, carbon footprint um, mechanism and how to calculate it. So it's like you have to understand carbon amounts. How are you going to compute it? So these are science that even the supply side have yet to understand. And what more so on the part of the demand side. So at the end of the day, it's actually the cost that we have to address. Or even if there are the, the budget, specifically in countries that are already considered as high income economy, they don't worry about the, prob the, the budget. The problem is that the options are not available as much as they would like to. Specifically, this happened during the pandemic when the supply chain was disrupted and they realized that these options were not yet available in, in their country. And then, of course, when you talk about low carbon procurement, say, for example, vehicles, this is not just about, OK, there are vehicles. The issue is that when the government, for example, mandated that all government should procure electric vehicle, the problem is that you have to make sure that the infrastructure are there. And infrastructure is like an electric vehicle. You have to have charging station. So in this case, this is not just about the Ministry of Finance mandating even the transportation sector has to make sure that the infrastructure is there. And then at the end of the day, of course, those countries that are still um, wanted to, to do more, even sustainable and green procurement, they are having this challenge of lack of legislation. And we have countries in our region that still need support to be able to address this particular problem. And countries have already received so many external support. But the challenge is that after the support, OK, you have lunch, you have just GPP, roadmap. What happened is that sustainability, 
So there are countries that have been assisted even by UNEP, by multilateral development banks in the launching of their GPP roadmap. But after that, nothing happened. So it's like, and, but this is not only happening also in, in Asia. We try to review all the other countries. It's on the progress and you see that there is really a, a problem on sustaining the launching. So these are some of the challenges uh, provided by the stakeholder during our interview. At then rate, one thing good about, about all of us working in this particular field is despite all of these challenges, we are very, uh, you know, uh, optimistic. We are very optimistic. We are not giving up that this is something that we want to do. This is something that we're not just buying. We are strategic partner of our country. That's why when asked like, if you can do anything to make sure that low carbon procurement will become uh, the a default in the future, these are some of, of the, the good, um, um, let's say, um, suggestions or oh, wish lists. But at the end of the day, these are something that is being done already. For example, they say, you know, there has to be a self-sustaining financial mechanism for GGP and eco-labeling. If you will notice in the problem of the costing, there are so many financial incentives right now. If you are a, 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 an economic operator, you know, providing environmentally friendly products, you can give a tax, um, um, let's say tax rebate or some of the financial assistance are already available. So there are countries that are, are doing, providing financial and even tax exemption for those operators that are you know, addressing this so that the financial problem will, will be addressed. And then of course, in terms of capacity building, this is, UNEP has been doing it. We've, we've been trying to reach people to make sure that they understand if you are just participating in the 12.7.1, this is not just about monitoring, this is actually capacity building in terms of how we can address that particular barrier. And then of course, the other thing is that how can we make um, this, the, the low carbon option is as the same price or as attractive as the standard product. That's, that's something um, we could we could do, hopefully, yes, because if you will look at the overall life cycle costing and you have to understand that this is not just about the outright price, but at the end of the day, you know, the total cost, we've been, we've been telling some of our networks, specifically in the government, how much budget do you have for addressing pollution? Why not put those budget, you know, in terms of putting it in promoting a low carbon option? So this is just a matter of understanding budget and the impact on how we can really maximize the use of our very limited budget. And here, very interesting, the last is says, we just hoping that we could just, we couldn't just buy things at damaged environment. And would that be possible? It said, so, so the, one, one thing I learned from, from a stakeholder's interview is that she said, before, who would think that we, could, that we couldn't buy a straw, you know, single straw years ago? It is something we couldn't perceive, but right now it is something we couldn't buy, at least in some countries. So in that case, we can make a world in such a way that those things that are damaging the environment is something we couldn't buy. Cambodia did it in an example. We couldn't longer buy and also depleting refrigerator. So that is something that is being done right now. And of course, there are so many other practices. I could name few a lot. When we release this particular uh, work, we have actually put them all, so you can reference them once the the, the 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 final paper is released. But at any rate, these are just some of the national policies that is in best example. Why this was considered as best practices, at least before, at least um, uh, two reasons. First, it is mandatory. If you look at the challenge, there's no legislation. Sometimes, you know, it requires a mandate to do it. They have to like push the button and say, do it, and we will comply. So this is having a specific 
mandate to do it. And then not just mandate, but a target. Because if you have a particular mandate, but you don't have a target and a monitoring mechanism to make sure that your mandate and target are really achieved, then you will just have something like a dream, you know, not necessarily an actionable work. So these particular practices actually highlight those three. There is a mandate, there is a target, and they are actually monitoring it. And just to give you a, some idea, we try to like highlight how those countries are doing it in the actual practice. At least, how are they integrating low carbon criteria in the public procurement cycle? I try to put it in the simplest public procurement cycle, although we know that there are just so many ways by which we can expand the cycle, but just the simplest public procurement cycle, we can actually see how we can integrate low carbon criteria. First, in the planning. It is very important that you start from there. As mentioned, you must have a target. Some of the best examples is that they have this carbon reduction threshold. And then, of course, they identify the available um, technology, even the available alternative. One example is, for example, is, is the case of you know, reduction of greenhouse gas emission to uh, procurement of e-vehicles. But some municipalities could not afford it. So instead of that, they decided to lessen the use of vehicle. So in terms of transportation, so they put it like, you know, this is not one contributing the reduction of, of carbon emission, but not by procuring a vehicle, but by reducing the use of vehicle per se. So you see, so because you cannot afford, you try to find ways on not to do, make it a necessity to have a vehicle. So that could be your, your uh, uh, alternative if you have a problem with the budget. And then of course, in terms of solicitation, it is very important that you already defined your low carbon specification and award criteria. And most of the available practices right now is of course in the use of energy efficient goods and services. UNEP has published a lot of criteria on that. And then the other one is then the low carbon performance materials by requiring them to actually integrate in the product is how how is this actually contributing to the reduction of greenhouse gas emission and in terms of another specification if you don't have the particular idea yet some countries are actually requiring the the economic operators to provide them the solution so this is how they are introducing low carbon criteria and the solicitation. And then when they go to contract management and utilization, it's very important that you should have low carbon clauses. And how are they doing it? Of course, as mentioned, you have to have indicators because sometimes, you know, I work on the, in the legal, we just put some clauses but the problem is how, how are we going to make sure that these clauses are actually uh, implemented? You don't just put protection of the environment, compliance with all of all of these laws, but you have to set KPIs. And it could be like, you know, reducing transport emission and continuous improvement, allowing the, the, the economic operators to provide further uh, suggestion. In fact, one of the most um, used uh, contract clauses is, is what they call is like, okay, you provide the solution and then whatever energy savings that that solution that you are committing to have, you know, you'll get that as your payment. So that is precisely some of the, the emerging contract clauses. And of course, there has to be penalties for non-compliance. And you have to also include, there are so many countries that they have this particular environmental criteria, and then these are mandatory in the private sector. Sadly, the, the public 
procurement office were not yet aware of it, and they are not actually the one implementing it. Sometimes, uh, you know, environmental uh, monitoring board are even stricter on the private compliance and not on government contracting because of the lack of awareness in terms of this, how to integrate this standard in government contracting. And at the end of the day, you know, some of the countries have already introduced what they called as carbon reduction plan from the very beginning of the planning so that they would see that their particular procurement is really intended to mitigate the negative impact of climate change. So that's why they already have this target. And then when they are implementing the project, they are assessing the uh, uh, the target from the actual. And of course, from there, you'll see, are we achieving what we have set as a carbon reduction threshold? And that is very important. Otherwise, you'll have all of this, this criteria, but you are not sure on whether or not that is being accomplished. So that's that's it for the, the the assessment that we have, but for purposes of our our webinar right now, these are some of the the question that I would like to present to the the group for discussion. Can you go over the questions? You're muted, uh, Jelly. OK, so I have three questions. I have three questions for all of the participants that are here right now. First is how would you describe your uh, agency's level of experience in introducing low carbon criteria in the public procurement process? Have you started or just planning or did not even think of it yet? And second is that what do you think are the instrument that will drive you because we are all buyers where do we implement it that would help us integrate this criteria in our procurement practices. And what do you think would encourage private sectors to voluntarily submit low carbon and tenders like in the case of, of Sri Lanka, they are not even required you know, to bring their best practices in the private construction, but they, they did it when they submit their bids in in government contracting. So those are the three questions that I really want uh, to get your um, insight for purposes, of course, of improving further our assessment. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Molino, and I think you deserve a round of... Hear the question, Jelly? Yes, I can. Yes, okay, okay. Okay, please go ahead. So actually, as mentioned in the methodology, this is actually based on desk review. So I got all the copies of okay. the public procurement law from the World Bank data on global public procurement database. Okay. So from there, yes, I, read, uh, I, I read the, the provisions, but I verify. You know, if you look at the global okay. public procurement database, they already have like no, none yet. That's why I have their blue and okay. and the red because I read the, the, the data, the law, okay. and I say, okay, you don't have this, but in this provision, this can be used to promote um, uh, most economically. The word most economically is not mentioned. But the fact that yes. there is provision considering non-price criteria, there is provision mm -hmm. promoting social economic. Yes, that is considered. I, I ask this because, uh, yeah, because uh, still we are uh, we have not uh, many information regarding some background uh, uh, in the public procurement, and uh, we are we are we we expect to collect uh, do the information survey next year. We are planning to do do that. So this kind of information from your side also very much important. So we can consider about this uh, information in our uh, uh, survey. So thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, with this very interesting uh, presentation from you. Thank you, Mr. Ali and Mr. Fari. Thank you to you. Uh, now, and then I have uh, Ding Ling from China. Any reaction, any questions? 
question? Then, uh, representative from the Environmental Management uh, Center. No question. Uh, Gilbert Quaresma, can you introduce yourself and give us your feedback? Hello. Hello. Yes, Gilbert. I am from the government uh, of the Philippines. So, oh, in terms of question number one, can you can you put your uh, question in writing or your comment because uh, we can't hear you very well. I'm really sorry. Please put your uh, your comment or question in writing. I'll just um, add, yeah, I'll just add in my input in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have then uh, in consult. Uh, this is Iqbal Sheikh from in consult Pakistan. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, uh, Malino. Uh, in Pakistan, actually, currently what we are doing is we are uh, working on this particular intervention. We have carried out number of uh, the the uh, consultation workshops and awareness workshop. And I hope the substance and the material that we got from your presentation, we're really going to make use of it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. And uh, just I take up the opportunity to tell you that the study will be released in January and um, we'll have another opportunity, another webinar to present it uh, in full. Uh, Myanmar, we spoke about your country. Can you introduce yourself? KNL, Myanmar. Okay. Manoj Didwanya? Hello. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, Manoj, please. Sanjay? Hello, Sanjay. From India. Susan is on the call. Hello, Susan. Are you talking to me, Farid? Yes, yes, yes. Please, can you introduce yourself? Give us your feedback. Okay. Uh, I, I'm Susan Brown Shafi, and I'm sitting in on the call today from uh, Geneva. I'm very interested in uh, uh, these issues, and I, I just keen to hear the, the voices from the stakeholders, the problems that they're having, because yeah, I think a lot of times that's that's voices we don't hear. So, yeah, I don't I, I don't take more time today beyond that. Thank you. And you, which organization do you represent, or are you just? A... Well, I, I, I'm with a uh, an academic organization at the moment, uh, working with uh, uh, teaching uh, <clears throat> public practitioners uh, uh, skills on uh, evidence informed policy making. Okay, thank you, Susan. And then uh, Jing, China. Hello, Jing. Any feedback? Any uh, clarifications, um, questions? Thank you. <laughs> thank you for it, and thank you, Jelly. And I, I think uh, her the introduction very insightful and fruitful. And uh, just uh, last year, uh, oh. oh as the CEC also held uh, makers a uh, very initial in 
uh, research also on the uh, how low carbon or how uh, GPP or how SPP integrate into the national uh, NDC targets. Uh, so I, I think I need to learn from this report and uh, also um, make uh, some reference in the next step because um, uh, so far uh, uh, the government, not only the government, but also the procurer have the awareness make uh, should do some efforts to integrate the procurement to achieve the national targets of climate change but still and also there have energy saving in products and energy efficiency products and also environmental labeling products are involving in this area for such a long time but how to integrate this into with the NDC target is still a problem. So maybe in the future we will make more efforts and practice towards this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jing. And uh, I'd like to know, Jelly, how you integrated the, the findings of the really good study that uh, CEC uh, published with the uh, IGPN. You know on the topic on the subject and if uh, Jing you can share in the chat box the link to your study for the other participants and because it's recorded also it would be great thank you Jing. yes yes thank Over you for it you. yeah <laughs> yeah the, the IGPN have made the uh, report but it's now it was revealed in our ministry um, okay. maybe after that we will share okay. the link to you okay thank you yeah, I attended the, the, the webinar on the, uh, the result of the survey. Actually, th that was very helpful in terms of also identifying policies and frameworks. So that particular document was considered in this part in, in our uh, ongoing research. So thank you for that initial um, uh, assessment on the survey. So it was really very helpful. And the question is, how can we make this uh, concrete? You know, this. Uh, yes, actually, this. This is one of the, the 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 last chapter of this particular paper that we are working on is um, highlighting the gap of the UNFCC monitoring indicators because uh, our, our initial assessment is that the uh, questionnaire itself, you know, the indicator itself would not really uh, lead for the reporting agencies to even think of the strategic role of public procurement. So we have some recommendations on the UNFCC itself on how you know to make sure that a specific sub indicator on their questionnaire right now, because they have you know a questionnaire on how governments should report their NDC. Um, and one of the 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 recommendations that we're finalizing right now is to make sure that the UNFCC ways of asking reporting would be leading towards the government recognizing the important role of public procurement. So that is the, and, one and of the do you recommendations. Expect, do you expect the proportion of countries that integrate uh, public procurement in their NDCs to to raise or to rise in the in the coming yes. years? If 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 you know sometimes you have to design the system by the way you are asking the question. So if the the, the, the questioner per se, because in terms mm. of, of reporting, they are following a certain questionnaire. And if you look at the questionnaire, that's why only 10%, not that much, because the concept of sustainable consumption and production, at least on that particular side, should be highlighted so that, you know, and then the role of government on that SDG 12 should be very, very important in terms of 13, the, the direct relationship between SDG 12 and SDG 13 should uh, be one of our- Do you think the way the question is framed can help or can lead or can uh, yes. motivate countries to integrate public procurement or yes. uh, at least to disclose what they're doing in this area? Yes, because yeah. there are some countries 
that submitted the report just answering those questions. <laughs> they didn't put it in a narrative. They just, you know, answer the questions. They, they don't have a narrative. <laughs> so imagine if okay. you have yeah. sub, 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 sub indicator. Mm. I see. Okay. Last opportunity for questions and clarifications before we close. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is yes. Vikram. Please, Vikram, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Pri. Uh, hello, Dr. Maino. Uh, thanks for a detailed uh, presentation and a good analysis. Uh, my name is Vikram. I'm a, a SPP consultant with United Nations Environment Program India office. Uh, so I understand that uh, you refer to World Bank public procurement database for to understand the documents that are available related to uh, public procurement environment SPP. So. Uh, uh, I believe that the database is not that uh, updated. There is just one uh, policy related to public procurement at the state level. There are four other policies that were issued. So uh, maybe uh, if I can get your contact uh, information, I can maybe share some of the information with you so that the, this study can become more uh, uh, up to date for India at least. Please, uh, I use that database as a starting point. And after that, I look at the website of the targeted countries. In fact, some of them are not in English. So I try to um, um, using Microsoft uh, translation to translate some of the, the, the document, but only related to those already published in the database. This is not actually the database. When I, I check some of the World Bank colleagues, it's also a questionnaire in a sense that that's why what I did it is verified. If you look at the database of the World Bank, even if the, the database did not include that they have sustainability provision in the public procurement law, but because I read the law, I translated those that are not in English, I was able to like put um, um, blue marking saying that yes, they didn't have the exact word but they could be supported by other provisions. So, but please send me the, the documents. That's why this particular is mentioned in the initial, this what we're doing is part of our methodology. So if you have, I, I put in the chat, my email address, please any data that you think would be high, uh, impactful in making sure that this is uh, more robust, please send it to me and I will definitely include include them because as far as I am concerned, I think I, I tried as much as possible to be exhaustive in, in this particular research. But of course, given the, the limitation of the time, uh, there might be some documents that are not online, published online. So please send it to me. I, I that, that, that My email is in the chat and I appreciate receiving it. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll do that. Yes, thank you, uh, Jelly. One of the objectives of this uh, webinar is to make sure that we get your feedback, that you are we are exhaustive, we are up to date. So please don't hesitate to, to send us any information or any corrections that you think uh, we should introduce. We're still at the draft stage, and uh, Jelly is still working on on the study and making sure that we are uh, very comprehensive and up to date. So um, without further ado, maybe. Yeah, thanks, uh, Susan, for your comment. We're all looking forward to reading the report, to receive, to finalizing the report. So, um, uh, if there are no more questions, I will thank Dr. Molina. I, I think one, we can call you. I have you... one request. Okay. Yeah, I have one request. Can can we all put our 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 web camera on. Can I have a screenshot of all of yes, us here? Yes, do that. Please, please. So if it's not too much to ask for. For internal reporting, not necessarily for publication. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Just to see that I'm really talking to real people. Mm. <laughs>